The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hey there. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. We've tried to be here for you throughout this entire pandemic and all the craziness going on in the world. It continues, doesn't it? Anyway, we want to get you kind of absorbed into art, give you a chance to learn and grow in art. And that's why every day at 3 p.m. Eastern, we're putting out these art instruction videos. We've produced well over five, 600 of them. And today we have techniques of the Hudson River School Masters with Eric Capel. Enjoy. just adjusting the easel a little bit uh, so that my body's in a position to see see the view that I wanted uh, even though I'm going to be looking over my left shoulder which uh, because I'm left-handed is okay <laughs> got my brushes and palette knife accessible here and because I like to add and take away paint from my palette frequently I'll probably just leave my paint sitting here as long as I have enough room okay I think that's enough for the basic setup um, so now I'll get my palette ready and start looking to paint So we have our, our materials basically set up here. Um, first I'm going to talk about a little bit about the materials, then a little bit about the method, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So uh, what we have here is our, our basic palette knife. We have brushes, paints, and our solvent and medium. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the solvent and the medium. I'm using Gamsol, which is a mild solvent. Um, uh, it's good for cutting oil, but it can't cut resins or varnishes. So if you use this in a medium, um, it, it has to be just with oil. So that being said, the medium that I have here is uh, about 40% stand oil and 60% Gamsol. And uh, what that does is it takes the stand oil down from its sort of honey-like thickness to a more, um, a more uh, fluid medium that you can sort of glide across the surface with glazes um, and yet the qualities of the stand oil uh, cause those glazes to set and be very um, nicely workable on the surface especially on the the smooth surface that we're going to be working with today and so in this container i just have some of the gamsol solvent i'll just talk about the paints a little bit um, the hudson river school artists used a very basic palette um, especially for outdoor painting, but even in the studio. Um, it said that Gifford used eight colors outside. Um, Durand spoke um, 
chidingly to his students about not using too much color too soon because um, color can uh, deter you from, um, from seeing the drawing and the form and the atmosphere. And uh, Gifford referred to landscape painting as air painting. And uh, that, what that says to me is that the Hudson River School had a strong priority of, of light and atmosphere over, over um, strong bright color and that they in fact thought that uh, bright color could distract or take away from the light and atmospheric effect. And uh, for that reason, they used a very basic palette outdoors. These seven colors up here plus white makes eight would be what I would call my fundamental palette that, that I would be using for the most part. And then I've brought some extra colors in uh, that I put in this row here that I'm only going to use if, if there's a heightened color or a particular pop of color that, um, that I feel like I need to get. Um, but I have a feeling from looking at today's view that I might be able to capture it with just a very simple palette up here. But I've divided these, these um, colors into groups. We have the neutrals, uh, you know, just burnt umber, and the whites. Um, I use burnt umber instead of other browns um, at the early stage because it has a lot of warmth in it, especially when it's transparent and it, it has a lot of redness in the tone of the brown which works really good with the warmth of shadows that we find out in the landscape. Um, for the whites, the primary white that I use most of the time is Gamblin's Flake White Replacement, um, which we have here. And I also have a quick drying white from Gamblin, which uh, sometimes is good outside when you're traveling because you'll find you need your paintings to dry faster if you don't want to carry them wet. And uh, that can be useful with us here today. Um, so those, those are the neutral colors, and now we have reds, yellows, and blues. So um, the two reds that I have here are, are both from Gamblin, uh, Burnt Sienna and Venetian Red. Um, the Venetian Red is, uh, is a red-brown that, uh, when it gets mixed with white, um, will go towards a cooler side where the burnt sienna tends to stay a little bit on the warm side. Now you can just put these here so you can see the difference. The burnt sienna is also a little darker, but when it's, when it's um, placed transparently on the light surface, it has a lot of power and warmth to it. And so it's a really good versatile color for, for outdoor painting. Um, and uh, these are both by Gamblin. And one thing that, uh, one thing that I find with a burnt sienna it's, it's not so important what brand it is, but there's two different uh, pigments of iron oxide that are sometimes used in burnt sienna. One is calcined and one is uncalcined iron oxide. And um, I, prefer, um, I prefer to have the, uh, the calcined burnt sienna because it, it has a slightly more opaque consistency and it doesn't get so fiery and hot when, um, when it's spread out transparently. And if, if you use the, the uncalcined, then you'll find that it's a vi if I were to do the same thing with my finger, it's a very bright orange. And that's not quite the color that I'm looking for in my, my earth palette. So um, <clears throat> the, the third red that I have here that I don't think I'm going to need today, but that if, if, I, if I needed a really bright red or I needed to get out of that break out of the color range that I was in, um, I, I might add some alizarin crimson, which um, you know is is a very powerful, very transparent color, and it's a it's a cooler red, but um, it can also be mixed with these warmer reds to make a more a more pure color. And you can see kind of a pure red as I touch that to the Venetian red, and also a slightly darker pure red if I mix that with burnt sienna. But um, Again, I, will, I would caution students against going with too strong a palette too quickly, <clears throat> at least if you want to replicate the effects of the Hudson River School. And so I'm probably not going to touch this tube today at all. But um, so over to the yellows. Um, I'm fairly particular about yellows, particularly with, with the Naples yellow. Um, so I have yellow ochre here and Naples yellow. But this Naples yellow is um, a fairly expensive tube of paint. It's from Old Holland, and it's, it's Naples yellow deep extra, um, which is the, the only Naples yellow that I've found that has, has a fairly strong 
um, yellowy tone to it. And um, again, it's like the other two colors, it, it's not, it doesn't look very different from the, just like the Venetian red and the burnt sienna are close together, these two colors are very close together, but um, they have different working properties. You can see that the Naples yellow is a little bit cooler and it tends to go cooler and cooler um, as, as uh, it's mixed with white, whereas the yellow ochre tends to stay on the warm side. Um, and so I use these two in conjunction with the blues to make all kinds of varieties of green. Generally, like the Naples yellow will be used to make um, brighter, cooler greens and the, the ochre will be used for, for the warmer, earthy greens along with the blues. And then the third yellow that I brought, um, if we really want to heighten these up to, to a higher yellow range is, is Naples yellow, or um, is Indian yellow. And so I probably won't use much Indian yellow today, but I just want to have that there as an option so that if these, if these colors need to be made brighter, this color has, has the power to sort of do that. And especially, um, especially if you mix it with a little bit of white, um, Indian yellow can make a very true yellow where, uh, where the other yellows will tend to go more muted if I, if I take a brush and just add, add a little white to them. You can see the Indian yellow still has a lot of yellow to it when I add white and the Naples yellow goes very quickly to white. Um, the ochre does the same thing, but is a little bit warmer. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of the character of the yellows we're using today. And I'm just going to go on to the blues, um, which one of the blues isn't really a blue at all. It's black. Um, and I, I use any number of blacks for this. I love lamp black. Um, this is Mars black. But to me, to me, all the all the blacks are fairly similar, and it it doesn't really matter which one. But um, the 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 black is obviously warmer than the ultramarine blue, which this is. And I also, I'm not incredibly uh, particular about my ultramarine blue. I like French ultramarine and ultramarine blue hue, and um, I've used Old Holland ultramarine ultramarine blue deep from Old Holland quite a bit. Um, this one, I believe, is a Windsor and Newton ultramarine blue. Um, but I'm not too particular about that. But again, um, so the, obviously the, the colors from the black will be warmer blues than from the ultramarine blue. But again, there's qualities of the color that shift when you add white. And especially um, when, it comes to the, when it comes to the black, you really get the blue color out of it by by adding white to it and so if i put if i put a little white with that you can see that 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 gray starts to be a blue and the, the more black i pull into it the more it becomes a, a, a neutral blue of course this is a gray palette so it doesn't show up too much as a blue but if i put it in front of this burnt sienna then the blue color comes out but again that's that's not because I'm trying to make the, the brightest blue that's possible with oil paint. It's, I'm trying to use it as a more neutral, warm, cool color. Um, and here, obviously, with the white, the ultramarine blue can form a very bright blue. Um, and then if that's not bright enough or, or actually too cool, the third blue that I sometimes add in, and that's also useful for, for making brighter greens, is, is Prussian blue. Um, which you can see right away is a really strong color. Um, it's very dense and very transparent. And um, sometimes, there's, sometimes there's blues in the green range that are tough to achieve with ultramarine and the yellows. So like if I, if I just demonstrate a little bit of a, a blue or green here by adding some Naples yellow, that's kind of a gray blue green, where if I did the same thing with that Prussian blue, you can see right away that it forms a very bright uh, turquoisey color, and um, that color I would consider dangerous. <laughs> and so it, you you don't want to use that color too much uh, until you're really at a point where you say, okay, I have to I have to get brighter 
than the range of, um, of the palette that I'm using. So I've designed this basically in a way where I want to encourage, um, and I'll put the, I'll put the uh, burnt umber out here too, um, I, I want to encourage students to go as long as possible and to get as much as they can with this row of colors here, the white, Naples yellow, yellow ochre, Venetian red, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, black, and burnt umber, and then try and go as far as you can discovering all the relationships in the landscape with just those colors. And then if you need a pop, if you really need something brighter that you can't get, then incorporate these three other colors only as needed. Um, Indian yellow, alizarin crimson, and Prussian blue. And um, a, a strategy for doing this is not only in the way that, that we manipulate the paint with transparency, and I'm just going to demonstrate um, a little more of the range of these colors transparently um, by adding some medium to them. Um, we get a broader range out of the colors, like look at that beautiful yellow when I just add medium to the Naples yellow. We get a broader range out of these colors by adding transparency to them. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to use that transparency to try and develop the full range that these that these first eight colors have before, um, before you go on to relying on those other three. And, and then to prioritize color relationships and light and atmosphere over, over pure accuracy of the color to what you find in the landscape. Um, so that is to say, at first you're going to find with the limited palette that it might be difficult to capture exactly what you see but what you will be able to capture is the range between the things that you see. That is that like if there's a cool green and a bright blue, um, you might not be able to get the exact bright blue and the exact cool green, but you can get the relationship of those two things to be accurate. Um, and you can always brighten up the color later with glazes, which is a, a tremendous, well-documented process that that the Hudson River School were known to use all the time. Um, so that, that, that is, once you've got the canvas all set up and you let it dry, um, you find that a blue isn't as bright as you wanted it or as bright as you remember it, then you might put a light wash of ultramarine blue just like this over the sky and it'll just subtly tint it into that brighter range maybe which you recall finding in the landscape. So that's, that's pretty much it for paint. Um, we've talked about medium already. I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about some of the brushes that I'm going to use today. So I'll get the palette knife out of the way. Um, a lot of the painting that I'm going to be doing is just going to be with round um, Sablat brushes. These ones are from Utrecht, but uh, what's, what's important to me is that the brushes are soft and um, Hopefully they can still get somewhat of a point once, once there's medium in them. And you can see that improve the point of the brush quite a bit. But these, these soft brushes I'm going to be using for spreading paint around a lot. Because I work on a very smooth surface, soft brushes are great to um, smooth out the paint and remove some of the streaking and paint texture that occurs when you're using transparent paint. Um, so I'll set those aside. and. I also brought two of these brushes, which are big, soft, flat brushes, um, which are, are really useful for smoothing out the sky and for smoothing out glazes um, in other parts of the painting. But the idea is once you've put the paint on, you use a brush like this to, to glide across the surface and even it out. And I can even quickly um, demonstrate that right here on the palette. If I put a little, a little paint here on this very smooth palette and it has all these brush strokes in it, I go like this and it evens it out into a sort of smooth, transparent tone. And that's, um, that's a very desirable part of glazing because we can, we can um, work up a transition between two things. You know, here's one blue and here's, here's a whiter blue. And we can work up that transition very lightly, very roughly like this, and then smooth it out with this. The palette is a little streaky to get that, but um, 
that's the basic idea. Putting a little paint up here and then just softening it gently with the flat brush. So that's what we're going to use it for up here. Um, another brush that I use a lot for, for detail work and for, for drawing and for, um, you know, anything tiny that I might do is, is this, these riggers, which are a liner brush, and I can just draw a very fine line and, um, and work on the little details of the painting. And this one will flatten right out once I add some medium to it. And um, we'll use that for that. Um, so little branches, little leaves, details, highlights. These brushes are very useful. You, once you've used it for a long time, you get comfortable with it. You can hold it far back and make a long, elegant line that describes what you're seeing. I also brought a few brushes with me that um, are just old, ragged, beaten up brushes that um, sit around the studio, but that I use sometimes for very specific things. And you can see that you wouldn't want to use this for any delicate work, but um, sometimes if you're filling in a large area of leaves, leaves or if you're limited in time, a brush like this can be used to sort of make a general stipling effect. Um, which, which can even out textures and, and creates the sort of complexity that some, some of nature presents to you. I mean, we're, we're encountering a lot of like infinite textures out here, texture in the bark, texture on the grass, in the leaves, even out in the deep space. And like sometimes if you sketch something in very loosely and then, and then even it out with, this, with a brush like this, just blotting it around, um, you can see it creates a texture that can, can very much resemble nature. And then, and then you might go in with a more specific brush and add just a couple details to that texture that, that will really tell the viewer um, what, uh, what that thing is and give, give, give the viewer more specific information. So it's the, the stipling effect of texture isn't something that you would want to use just on its own or just overuse, but if you have a brush like this to sort of describe large masses, then you can refine things using your knowledge of what you see and studying more of the subtleties that are out there. So that's all for the brushes. Um, next we're going to talk a little bit about the technical method and then we're going to get onto the canvas and start um, working on this landscape. So just before we get started, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about the surface here and the process. Um, so We'll start with the surface. Um, what, what I have here is a, is a gessoed panel um, that, is, that is ultra smooth, and I don't know if it's, it's easy enough for you to see that, but I just wanted to compare with this, this, this surface, which has canvas on it, which you can see has um, a textured quality to it. And um, you'll notice in the museum that many of the Hudson River School painters are, are working on a very smooth surface, both out, in, outdoors and indoors. Um, Outdoors, they would often use prepared paper or, or panels, and then indoors, they would take their canvases and prepare them very smooth. And um, the, the reason is that um, the textured surface can um, sort of grab paint and, um, and cause it to have a texture on it, where the smooth, the smooth surface, um, you can get a very, even, a very even wash of paint without grabbing without grabbing any texture. So when I put these two things together, um, you can see what I did with my finger there is just barely visible and is very even. But what I did the same thing with my finger here, it created a lot of texture. And uh, that, that texture catches light and shadow and, and um, makes darkness. So we're, 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 trying to, we're trying to make a nice, light, atmospheric, airy painting outdoors. And, um, the smooth surface will allow the most light to penetrate the transparent washes of paint and, and, uh, and so we'll come back with a light painting. And also the smoothness of this surface makes it more ideal for capturing detail as well. Um, so I'll get rid of this and we'll talk a little bit about um, this demonstration which I've done for students before, which uh, it's just an invented landscape. but. Um, it shows a little bit about the process that I'm going to go through, 
We've already done a drawing in the sketchbook to get an idea of where our composition is going to be, but we'll want to lay those things out on the actual panel like this. And um, this all the same compositional principles that I was talking about in the sketchbook, we're going to try and get those things right here before we start actually applying color and tone. Um, and we'll do it with a very light wash so that the colors that are in there uh, don't interfere with, with, with the painting later and, and they'll just disappear behind, um, behind the second phase, which um, is, is basically a wash phase. Uh, so this second phase here was done with a three, three colors wash. I took one red, one yellow, and one blue, and those were ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, and burnt sienna, and no white, and, and maybe a little bit of brown, but um, the idea is by not using white, I'm allowing all these colors to remain transparent, and I'm building the whole unified effect of the picture um, before I go into any of the details. Um, and obviously with one red, yellow, and blue, I can't get all the colors specifically, but I can try to get all the color relationships, you know, like if the sky is warmer at the bottom and cooler and bluer at the top, and if the leaves are, these leaves are greener and yellowier than, than the cooler greens that happen out here, I'll do everything just by adjusting the amount of red, yellow, and blue, and the amount of medium to create those those long transitions so obviously if i'm if i'm using more medium spread out really thin i'll still have a lot of the white of the surface and if i'm using less medium and applying the paint fairly heavily i'll have that density of a dark um, a warm dark color that that will come forward so these lighter more airy things with 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 more medium spread very thin go back and then these these densely painted areas come forward and once I've established that whole structure of the picture from from the deep space all the way to the very front um, then I'll move on to um, the final stage of the painting which is which is where it really gets refined and um, you'll notice between this stage and that stage that I've left the tree a little bit smaller so it has room to grow out and when I want to paint all these more specific leafy edges um, I can do that, so I'll plan that into the process of the picture. You can see it was bigger again here, and then it got smaller for this part. But when I get over to here, I'm going to work from the back of the picture to the front. So I'll try to get a fairly resolved sky and atmosphere and deep space, um, and, then, and then come forward and handle like the, the little leaves that are closer to us and the trees that are closer to us, and I'll come across the grass. And then I'll, once all this back there is done, I'll end by painting painting as closely as I can the, the beauty of this group of trees which we've planned into our composition. Um, and by then the sky will have set up and will be, will be fairly, um, fairly stable and a little bit dry so that, I can, um, so that I can paint these little leafy edges very particularly over it. Um, okay, so that's the basic process that we're going to follow. Um, so now I'm going to move on to our surface and, and start preparing this to, to work on the painting that we're going to do. Starting to address our smooth surface, what I'm going to do is get a clean rag and we're just going to, we're going to make a very light ground. Um, just barely tinting it with some warmth and uh, I was just reading uh, a text on Gifford's process of painting, and um, he did the same thing, just started with a, a very lightly tinted ground, and I'm going to use some solvent to do that rather than, um, rather than oil, uh, because, it, because it'll help it be even and it'll set up very quickly so that when I'm painting the canvas, it, or the, uh, the panel isn't too wet. Um, so I'm just taking this off momentarily, and um, getting the rag and a little bit of burnt sienna, just spreading out that thin is a very wash, a, a very washy thin tint of turpentine, and, or um, not turpentine, Gamsol, and um, I'm, making it, I'm making the rag and the, and the paint very wet so it'll spread easily over this surface with a very subtle tint just warming everything. And um, an interesting thing that it said in, in the, the account of Gifford's process was that the reason he did this was, was one, obviously, to warm 
warm the white of the canvas slightly. But <clears throat> the other factor is that it's, it said that it prevented the colors from being too bright. And, and that's um, an interesting sentiment in this day and age because we have a lot of uh, prioritization of, of, of brighter color. But um, it, it was interesting that they said very, very boldly in that account at that time that like part of the goal was, was to capture, um, was, was to keep the color calm in favor of, of light and atmosphere. And that, that is probably one of the things that is distinctive about Hudson River School painting. So now that it's all even, you can barely see that the ground is there. Um, but we do notice that, that now the canvas is warmer and, um, and is just sl slightly tinted. And what I've done is taken a dry part of the rag and, and really taken off any of the excess because I don't want this to be too... Uh, I, I don't want to lose the lightness of the canvas. So that's why I take the dry rag and take off the extra. And then fairly quickly that'll absorb in. But now as I put it up here, you'll see it still looks basically like um, basically like a white canvas, but I know that there's a little bit of paint in there that um, that is going to be warming the, and affecting the paint that, that I put on. I just want to remind you as we do our drawing that this is, or as we, as we start to draw on the canvas with paint, that this is basically what we're going to try and get on there. So I'm talking about putting a tree here and, and it's good it's good to sort of look at your drawing and remember and try and plan out um, where things are going to go and just visualize it before before you actually start painting because so often um, students especially like uh, when they approach the canvas they they forget about the rectangle and then end up moving things from their original intention and and even I still fall for that sometimes and and I'd like to get the composition that I intended to get. So I just look at my drawing and I visualize it on the canvas before I start drawing. And I'm going to do the drawing with burnt sienna. And so I'm going to get that sharp pointy brush and I'm still just using Gamsol. Um, and I'm going to look out at the landscape and um, and well notice, notice here actually with my brush that I'm um, I'm putting a little extra Gamsol to get a nice soupy, almost ink-like consistency because I want this drawing to be light, you know? And then what I do is once I have a little puddle and that inky consistency, I wipe the brush so that it's dry. Um, and that way, as, as I go and take paint from this puddle, I can control the amount of paint that's in the brush. Um, and this is an important skill to start to learn because it, it teaches you to be able to create values um, you know, different values of, of paint in a range from a very dark value where the paint is dense and as there's more more solvent and things get washed out, you can make, create a scale to a very light value just by controlling um, the amount of paint that's in your brush and the amount of solvent that's in your brush. You can see how, how quickly and easily I, I created the full range of values um, that are in this burnt sienna. So. I want to take my paint from around this range because I want to make my drawing of the landscape very light. Um, so I'm just going to look out at the view and remember where I got my composition from. Remember all the parts that I want to put in. Visualize them on the surface. And then I tend to start at the foreground, laying in the key objects where I know I want them to be. So. Um, we're going to have a little bit of grass before us before we come up to, to the place where um, we're going to plant this grouping of trees. <clears throat> and I know I want the grouping of trees in so that I have room for, for a second grouping a little bit further back. Um, and I'm just, what I'm basically doing is drawing, but I'm drawing lines on the ground plane so that as I, as I sort of put the little pieces together, I know where I am in space on the ground plane. And what I mean by that is if I'm planting the bottom of the trees here, then I know that the next grouping of trees being back here will be further in space because it's, it's further up on the ground plane. Um, so I'm always looking out there for little things that help to describe to my eye 
where things are in space and, and how they're moving into the space. So uh, I'm finding that you know, a field um, in and of itself is just a flat plane, but there's lots of things in the field, like little, little groupings of rocks and, um, and bushes and things that if I just sort of describe those things very lightly and easily, I can, I can start to get a feeling for how I'm moving across that ground plane back into space. And just for the, for the sake of clarity, I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll kind of insert the, insert the arc of that tree and just, just so I know about the space that that, that tree is going to occupy. But again, you, I'm going to remember that I want to keep the tree light and small and not over describe it because this is only the first phase and when I go back to paint the sky and the things behind it, I don't want all this wet paint on the tree mixing with, with the new paint that I'm going to be adding today. There's another tree out in front of that grouping and the bushes lead us back to that. There's an arcing branch that comes back here and then I'm going to go back to the edge of the field and put in that, that second grouping of trees. Um, so this one ends in a cap there and this one spreads roughly through that area. Um, and what I find is once I've established um, a movement across the plain in the foreground, you know, I might put some of these bushes here to bring that, that corner forward. Um, I decided to leave out a tree from this side, so I'm going back to the grouping of trees that are at the edge of, of the, the field. And um, what I find is that once, once I've started to establish this plane and I start thinking in space, then it, 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 it starts to become easier to, to, to really draw space. So um, just by looking at what's, what's behind what else. And, and so I, I paint this tree and then I paint the hill behind it and, and I'm making all the pieces fit together along one plane that's just driving back. And so that hill, I made the line a little bit wrong. I'm just going to carry it on so the hill goes right over to there and then working back towards that horizon. And um, The reason I was able to work across that plane towards that horizon is because I knew from the compositional drawing that I did in advance how all these pieces were going to fit together. So <clears throat> what we have here is basically phase one. There's, there's enough information for me, for me to paint the sky and, and start to insert the, more fully the elements of the composition um, but I haven't overdrawn this with, uh, with all kinds of details and, and things that are just going to have to get covered up in, um, in the subsequent layers as I try and capture everything that's in this view. So moving on to the second phase from, from my little description of the process, we're going we're gonna to block in the composition in, in just, um, just transparent paint with one red, yellow, and blue. So I'm going to get this Venetian red out of here. We're just going to use the burnt sienna. We'll take ultramarine blue and yellow ochre. So I have these three colors ready and um, right in this area is where I'm going to mix them up and try and get the range of, of colors and values that are out there just with red, yellow, and blue. And uh, some, something <coughs> that some students have found helpful when I demonstrate is just, um, I, I don't do this every day when I'm painting, but just like I was taking that burnt sienna and stretching it out to a lighter value, and then if I take the ultramarine blue and stretch it out to a lighter value, then I can start to see also the color transitions that happen between those colors. And you can see it's, it's a basic gray purple, but I can find a purple there out in the middle. And then I can find the orangey tones between burnt sienna and ochre. And then of course, 
I can find the, the green tones between, um, between blue and yellow. So I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to um, clean some of this up after to, to be able to paint. But I just wanted to uh, sort of illustrate the transparent range of these colors and how easy it is to find those different colors just with these three, as long as they're not um, too polluted with white. So that's a very basic color wheel. And now I'm just going to clear out the area where I'm going to draw paint to work. And sometimes, <clears throat> you know, if I want to have an orange range and a purple range, I'll lay out, or, or say a purple range and a green range, I'll lay out extra spots of color on the palette just for that purpose. Like I might put a blue right over by my yellow just for making greens in this area. So that's kind of the reason that I, I lay out the palette kind of organically so that I can put put things where I need them when I need them and you'll see um, you'll see as I go how that kind of develops. We're seeing a warmer color at the bottom of the sky and a cooler blue at the top and, and early in the morning that color at the bottom of the sky was more uh, orangey and, and, and peachy pinky and then as the day goes on it gets yellower and then it, it starts to get whiter but it's, it's still fairly yellow and we're doing the morning light here. So I'm going to go with a little bit, I'm going to go with a, um, a warmish color at the bottom of the sky. And uh, Gifford was, was one who said that um, the, the, the bottom of the sky near the horizon is, is the keynote of the picture. Um, it, it determines the color of the light in the painting and then the color in the light determines the feeling of the picture. So you can notice here that I'm going to paint right through my drawing as if it didn't exist. All I needed to know was that I could get back to that horizon um, without, without any trouble. And now that I know that the drawing fits in the composition, I can just go back and, and go full force into painting the sky. So I'm still using very thin paint because I want very light values in the sky. When you look out at the sky, you'll always notice that it's glowing with light, almost no matter what the situation is. And so I, I really want to preserve a lot of the, the white of the canvas here in the sky, or the white of the panel. And then I'm just ragging it out so that, so that it's a nice even tone and establishing warmth down there. and it's a warm color that's still very, very light. And then that color transitions up to the blue tone at the top of the sky. So rather than start down here at this line, I'm just gonna start up at the top and, and make a long transition blending those two things together, which I'm putting the canvas just up, or the panel just up here so that I can wash over that area with a rag without, without having it um, uh, leave a little white shape there. And so if you look at the palette, you'll notice that I'm thinning out the blue a lot uh, to make a kind of inky consistency. Um, and I'm just spreading that color fairly aggressively with the brush. And then, and then I'm going to quickly rag it out to try and make the, tra Oops. to try and make the transition down to that warm color. So this is, what we're, this is what we can achieve without having any white. At, a, at an incredibly light value, we can have a glowing transition between, um, you, you know, a glowing light transition filled with a, a lot of complexity of color, going from something light very seamlessly down to something very warm. Um, without, without ending up with muddy gray colors in between. And so I think, I, I mean, I, I know that this is hardly, this is very light and I don't know how well you can see it, but I think if I cover up, if I cover up the bottom, you can start to see that there's a long softness in this transition that, that really glows with the light of the sky. And I did that just by very quickly ragging these colors together. And so rather than fuss with that and do all kinds of clouds, you have to remember that I'm, that I'm on the, the second phase, the more, the more watercolory, washy phase. I'm just going to move quickly forward th through 
the composition starting down at the horizon with a blue that's a little bit purpley and I'm just going to wash in that horizon and if the if if the color is is too dark which that might be I'm just going to wash over it again after um, ragging my brush you know you might have noticed I just dried my brush like this and when you dry your brush it's like a sponge that can pull up the paint that's too wet and so I just lifted up the darkness from that leaving it really light and then I'm and then I can sort of adjust it if it's not blue enough if it's if it's too light then I can put more blue into it and and try again and um, I'm remembering that I'm going to be painting all these things again, so I don't want to be fussy. I just want to, um, to get it even. And I'm just going to flatten it out with that, that soft brush and move forward, because what, what we want at this stage isn't um, a finished painting. It's just, it's just the big transition from there up through the hill all the way to the front. I, I want to look how the color changes as it comes forward um, as I'm making this big transition. So what I notice is the blues are the bluest at the back and this is in, in varying degrees of scale this is almost always the case. They're bluest at the back and um, in the shadow value especially they're, they're getting more purple as they come forward until the foreground shadows are eventually um, going to be fairly red-brown like fairly warm and dark so so we're really going from blue to warm red brown through purple um, when when we're crafting the whole movement of light and color through the space um, especially in the shadows this can be hard to see sometimes because especially when your scene gets filled with light um, you you really only see the color of the things in the lights like you see the greens on the trees and things but the key to the atmospheric space is in the shadows so if you look at just the deep dark shadows you're going to see blue and then you're going to see a purplier blue and then it's going to start to get warmer and get to be this kind of atmospheric gray purple brown and then it slowly gets up to a warm dark brown in the foreground shadows and that that you will see almost all the time in Hudson River School painting. But you, you know with this palette, I'm gonna make those purples out of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, and that'll help bring out um, their grayness. You might have noticed I haven't incorporated much medium yet. That's because I wanna keep the paint really thin. But as I get to the foreground, I'll slowly be incorporating more medium to suspend the paint. Um, to suspend the paint in that oil, which will give it more vibrancy and um, warmth and rich, rich darks. Like paint suspended in oil makes makes rich, warm darks. So there's my kind of gray purple. It got a little bit dark, so I'm just going to rag it out. And you see, once, once I put that in, that, that made the blue look, look very, very light blue. And I might even just work on the transition back from that, from the one mountain to the other a little bit. Um, bearing in mind that we have a long way to go and we're just making a long transition from back to front with the intention of, of coming back and painting these things. So I've gotten up to my field edge and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get onto the hill that goes across in front of the landscape. And hopefully you'll see that like I'm, I'm keeping this all simplified and, um, and warm, but I'm slowly getting denser as I come forward in space. And then what often happens, which I don't know if it'll happen here yet or not, is when you, when you get to the front and, and fill in the front, then you can start to see um, where the weaknesses and the transitions are. And, and you can make all kinds of adjustments either here or in the next stage uh, to, 
to accommodate for those. And I'm going to recall that early on this morning there was a shadow coming across here, which was um, compositionally a good, a good idea to help the space to curve back and wrap around. So I'm going to put that shadow in. And then I have denser, darker shadows at the bottom of the trees that are going to be in that area. Starting to incorporate more burnt sienna as we're working up towards a browner shadow. And then we'll leave a little bit of warm light spilling across this foreground. It's getting to the phase where it's far enough along that I have to um, I have to start thinking about abolishing this white ground because it's it's um, it, it's as you move forward it starts to mess with your ability to see what you're doing. But I'm going to get those long morning shadows coming across the foreground. I'm I'm completely um, obliterating that little drawing that I did. Um, but the purpose of that thing wasn't to be some final final destination that you. Um, that you leave till the end of the picture. The purpose was to know that as you come forward you'll have room for everything that you want to be in the painting. It's just placement in the rectangle basically. So, so far I'm still just just burnt sienna, um, ultramarine blue, and yellow ochre. And if, if the burnt sienna is too ready orange you can neutralize it into a little bit more of a brown with ultramarine blue. Or if that, if, if that gets too cool and you have trouble with the blue coming forward, then you can incorporate some burnt sienna or uh, burnt umber at this time, which uh, I, I'm not going to do yet, but I may add some burnt umber before the end of this phase. So as I look out at the landscape and analyze colors, I'm not I'm not really being too particular yet about getting the color just as the color I see out there, but I'm more just building large relationships of color. Like I said, once you get forward you can start to see the the weak points a little more. Like I see a weak point where I've where I've left l light here which makes this area come forward from that area and and what I want to do before I go on is put a little more of a purpley color in there um, just to make sure that I'm, I'm transitioning back through that area. And um, as you can remember from our drawing, we're going to have all kinds of careful trunks drawn in here, we're going to have things blocking here, and um, we're going to have trees here. There, there's a lot of trees out there that, that will block a lot of what we put back there. But we want to establish this big color phase um, before we uh, before we go on to those details. And the reason is that doing something like this really keys your eye to the relationship of the space. Like um, if you just start going to try and mix all the little colors individually, um, it just becomes this endless array of of uh, of complexity out there that, that you could never possibly get every little thing that's in it. But now that I have this structure, sky coming through deep space, coming up to a foreground and the foreground dark shadows, then that's going to allow me to, um, to try and place everything I do within a range. You know, I have a range here and if I'm working at that level of space I need to know I, I need to stay in one little range and if I'm here I can, I can work more in that range and as I get forward I start to have the real warm darks. Um, a lot of problems students have when they start to work on the details of, of the hill, as your eye looks into it, it comes forward because your eye adjusts itself to the range that you're looking at out there. So like if you focus in on little groups of trees out here and look, look very closely at them, you start to see the darks as darker and the lights as lighter and that contrast pulls that thing forward. So by establishing this range, you're saying to yourself, okay, I am going to stick to that range out there um, and not, not let my eyes trick me as I adjust to the various little areas and, and focus on the big transitions of the big picture. Um, 
So I'm going to get, uh, before I move on to the next phase, I'm going to get my um, slightly smaller, sharper brushes out and um, just do a little bit, a little bit of placement of, of these, these trees and trunks. Not, not so much that I'm not going to be able to work in behind them, but um, I do want to know where things are. And also I'm going to incorporate the burn umber so that I really have a full range of, of uh, warm darks in the foreground. What I mean by that is, um, well, you can see how when I put the burnt umber on, how it really comes forward and sits as a foreground shadow, and it helps to make the background really glow with light. So I know I'm, I'm planting trees right here, and they're going to be arcing up here, and I'm just going to very lightly indicate those things because I don't want to be, I don't want to be tied down. Um, and I don't want too much paint messing up what I'm doing later. But so that's going to be there. That slightly more foreground tree is going to be there. And it, it leans away a little bit. And then the trees that are forming that wing are going to go up to about this height. And so I'm just taking a little bit of information from nature and and uh, reminding myself of the drawing that, that I washed away. There's going to be some larger middle ground trees there, a little middle ground there. <clears throat> and I'm going to remember that I'm going to occupy this space with, with foliage. I think just, just to make sure you can see um, where I'm going with this, I'm going to include a little bit of the foliage and trunks. So I'm not going to get every specific detail about it, but I do want you to be able to see how once I put, once I put something up in front of the sky, how it really makes the sky fall back and glow with light. So I, I'm going to start to draw in this tree, and uh, you know, tree drawing is is its own whole art, just like drawing anything is its own whole art, you can spend um, you can spend a lifetime trying to improve on your tree drawing. Um, <clears throat> but I've, I've found that by like studying the character and gesture of, of big clumps, um, you, you, can, you can establish a sense of the tree that, that you can then go in and become more specific about. But, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to block in those big clumps fairly loosely and I'm allowing plenty of sky to come through. Um, as I bring, bring this tree forward off of that bright light sky. It's always good to consider when you're working on clumps of foliage where you are in space. Like if you're on a clump that's coming forward, if it's falling back into shadow, and that, that gives your tree a sense of volume to consider that. I'll incorporate the deepest shadows more into the center of the tree because it's, it's the most likely area to catch dense cast shadows from all the leaves outside of it. And then the tree sort of becomes more atmospheric and flows with the sky as, uh, as it comes out towards the edges. But I'm not, I'm not copying exactly what I see here, but I'm looking for the big movements of space that are out there. Um, and also I'm looking for the movements that, that work with our composition, which, which is to say that we want to wrap around and fly out to space. And there's, you'll find that there's a lot of harmony in nature and that, that a lot of times the things that you're looking for are right there. I'm incorporating a little more blue into the green because I'm a little bit further back in space. So it's just going to have a little more atmosphere and be a little cooler. And that's, 
a good thing to think about is, is just, even, even if you haven't quite trained your eye to see all these subtle relationships yet, just to think about where you're in you are in space and to know that if you're moving back, you know, if you're at a different point in space, for the painting, for air painting, for painting light and air, you should be able to perceive an atmospheric transition between a different level of space. And if you look for that, you'll be able to find it. And like I said when I was drawing, you know, you, you, continue to, you continue to pay attention to the character of the tree. Like, think, think of the tree as if it were, as if it were a person and like what, what type it is and what it feels like. And capturing that feeling will, will enhance your perception of the tree. Like D Durand, though, though he was greatly into copying nature exactly, he also highly praised uh, Raphael's work who, who everyone is aware um, was not very much of, of a direct copier of, of optical situations. Uh, Raphael was, was copying a truth that, that was revealed by, by the character of things and by their nature in the universe, which, which is a, a philosophical truth. And the Hudson River School artists were into that idea. Durand wrote about Raphael and wrote about the difference between um, he, he wrote that, that, that Raphael was copying what he saw, but that what he saw was, was a thing of incredible beauty, and that's what made him able to copy it in that way, which, which was so unique and not, not necessarily what he was seeing optically, but, but, um, but what was the truth of the thing, that the, the truth of the thing is beautiful. So I've got my deep space plane established and I'm going to move forward to that secondary hill and while I'm working on that hill I'm going to be thinking of the transition forward into the middle ground. So as I work on this area I'm not just thinking hill, I'm going to be thinking furthest back hill, moving to forward hill, moving to middle ground and that way I'll be moving one loop of space that's going to prepare me to work on the foreground. And I always want to have that in mind, that uh, this hill is not a flat phenomenon. It's, an, it's a large mass of Earth that's moving in space, and that's going to be crucial to this composition. It's really where that atmosphere starts to materialize itself into forms, and we're going to try and get as much detail as we can into the forms of that area without bringing it forward. So I need a more purpley cool shadow color. I'm going to get that Venetian red a little bit closer to that white and I'll put a little ultramarine blue over there and I'll create this area right there. Someone described the area on Gifford's palette as where he mixed colors as a battleground. So if I want to make a purple, the battleground will be here between red, white, and blue. Let's get a little blue or purple. Let's see where we are. I want more white in that. I want a nice even more white for a cool color will make a nice even layer of space and so I'm just putting a nice load of white into there and spreading it around so it has a smooth atmospheric quality. I'm going to start to come up to the edge of the contour of the hill. I'm going to try and not make it too even. And I'm going to add little tree edges up there in a little bit. I'll add some texture to it. I'm going to um, 
use a warm brown color because I know a little bit of that color from the sky underneath is going to come through. So I've got burnt sienna and burnt umber. I'm also going to grab a brush to use as a mall stick. And I wanted to move my tree in a little bit closer to the landscape. So I think I'm going to plant that pair of trees right about here, just leaving a little bit, a little bit of area behind it. And I'm just going to add a little bit more medium so it's a nice light line when I, when I start to trace out where I'm going to place this tree in the composition. I want it to be, um, I want it to have that feeling of loft that it really, really swoops out into the landscape and um, rises up into this area of space. So this doesn't have to be perfect trunks yet. I'm just planning out the big, the big motion of this tree so I know that it'll occupy the space that I want it to occupy. And these, these lines will probably get buried under the more detailed work as, as the tree develops. And these beautiful oaks always have these, these lovely swoops in their branches, and I'll start to think about that um, as I block this in. Isn't it kind of nice the way this, this curve here counteracts the curve of that hill? It makes a, a, a lovely harmonic design that uh, is, is subtle. It doesn't, it doesn't beat you over the head with it, but, it, but it's apparent. And, it, and it's a, a gesture that shoots back into space, the, those two things against each other. So I'll plan a little bit where I'm going to have the counter-curving tree and its sort of massive foliage. And then I know I'm going to have some more trees over here blocking out a lot of the distant space on that side. And so if I have these ones planted on the ground here and here, then I have a deeper position of space here to sort of create a nice uh, grouping of trees to cover up that space so that we can really get back into the composition. A lot of times when I'm painting a studio painting, I'll go through several different figures before I find an option I like, but I might also wait a long time and look at the painting. And as I've looked at it for, for days and days, I sometimes discover right where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing. So we'll see if that happens later. Well, that is a small piece of techniques of the Hudson River School Masters with Eric Capel. He went around and studied all the masters, their notes, found everything about them, and then perfected that and teaches you in this video. You can learn more about the full-length video course at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code for you today only in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with Eric Capel. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes. Today we're here with Eric Couple. Eric and I first met at an opening in New York City at the Wally Finley Gallery uh, several years ago. I was in town doing some work and uh, Peter Trippi, the editor of Fine Art Connoisseur, said, hey, let's go over to this show. And we went to the opening and I was blown away by the work. Uh, I had not seen any contemporary artists doing Hudson River School paintings that were equally as good, that were stunning as those painted by the Hudson River School. And uh, so Eric and I met at that time, but I didn't quite frankly remember he didn't really leave an impression on me. <laughs> uh, no, his paintings left a big impression. He was busy. I didn't get a chance to talk to him that night. We then met again much later when we had an occasion to spend quite a bit of time together and become friends and we painted together. And uh, I just think that Eric is a genius. And one of the reasons we decided to get together and, and do this interview and, and uh, 
um, do a demonstration of, of your work. So uh, Sanford Gifford said that an artist is a poet. What are you? An artist is a poet, Eric. <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, art has varied between uh, a more sort of stoic philosophy and a more romantic poetic philosophy for most of the entirety of art history. And um, I think that uh, what great artists have done is tried to find a balance between those two things where maybe they're not so passionate that they're um, just floating away on feathers in the romantic side, but, but not so stoic that they don't uh, feel human compassion. And uh, I think that um, the great artists of the past have really uh, look deeply into themselves to try and understand their own humanity and um, if they've done their work well then they've they've shared that humanity in a way that everyone can understand. Is that relevant today? Well I think the kind of human issues that I'm talking about aren't things that change and disappear with fashion but are things that have been a part of humanity for the whole history that we're aware of. Um, although there's lots of fashions and lots of cultural phenomena and technology that are ever changing, there's also certain things that every human being that's ever been born and ever lived has, has had to deal with. Um, questions about why we're here, um, what are we doing when we're, when we're feeling love, when we're feeling fear, when we're worried about death illness, uh, birth, rebirth, um, these, these things are ideas that, uh, that I think every human being can relate to. And I think that um, the highest art taps into these ideas and um, reveals to its viewers something profound about, about their own existence. So when you paint these beautiful bucolic landscapes, what is it that you're hoping to say? Well, the landscape um, in painting is, is, is the big world. It's the big universe. Um, and, and I think for, uh, for human beings, we're, we're really trying to understand our place within that universe. And I think um, if I were to relate the experience of a landscape painting to... Um, an actual experience that a human being would have in a landscape. Like if you can imagine yourself hiking up a mountain and the hike is, is hard and, and um, you know, you're going up these rocks and you've never been on this hike before and you don't know what's at the end. Um, there's the creation of this um, amazing feeling of, of satisfaction when you arrive at the top of that mountain and there's a stone ledge there and you look out to this to this epic amazing view and um, what you're experiencing there is is the sort of transition between something that was hard and closed in buried under trees um, out into something that's just profoundly large and and open and and wide and that uh, that experience is is a metaphor for a philosophical transition in life you know from an obsession with these these smaller things that happen in our lives, you know, so and so did this to me, and and I lost this this money, and now I got some back, and I'm happy, and you know, there's all these little things that happen, but there are these specific moments um, where something really profound happens that that washes away all that individuality of you, and you're somehow dissolved into that sense of just being a part of that whole universe. And um, painting, for me, the landscape isn't really about depicting what's seen from that ledge at the end of that road, but depicting the, the human journey um, into that world and then discovering that, that incredible moment at the end. And so um, it's not really about just, just like, like making a painting of a landscape isn't about what the landscape really looked like it's about the experience of arriving there and and having that pr profound sensation and i think um the historic artists 
like the artists of the Hudson River School, were, um, were very interested in that idea. Like um, when they put these big rocks in the foreground and, and uh, the transition of a stream bed out towards a landscape and then it opens up into this big epic view and you look up and you see the trees coming over your head and, and you look down and you see the ground beneath your feet. Um, I think they're really trying to create a profound human experience where uh, the viewer walks into that picture as that traveler on that road and um, arrives out at that deep view um, through all these transitions of space. Well, there were also signals at that time, uh, well, throughout the history of painting, probably less so in our world today, but throughout the history of painting, there were uh, things that were painted in that were signals. You know, a, a rose lying on the ground had a particular meaning. Uh, a dead branch in a painting had a particular meaning. Have you studied what these meanings were and how some of the Hudson River painters were doing it? Yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can study um, you can study the meanings historically, and, and some things have been written down about it, and I love these little books on flowers and, and trees and stuff and what the trees mean, or even like Ovid's Metamorphosis, where um, he applies human meaning to all the changes in the universe and talks about the development of the laurel as, as the crown of the poet. And I love um, these, these ancient historic references to, um, to the elements of the landscape. But I also think that, that fundamentally for those, for those um, symbols and metaphors to really, to really come through and, um, and to work as a work of art, they have to be something that you can, that let's say it's something that's enhanced by that mythology, but it's something that you can understand um, just by, by your own viewing of the picture. Um, in, in a more fundamental way, just as a human being. Like, like if, we, if we see in Thomas Cole's painting, as we do very often, um, a, big, a big stump coming up in the foreground of a painting with one large broken branch that's been torn off of it, and then from that wreckage of that large tree, we might see a young sapling sprouting out of that stump and, and growing beautiful green leaves. Um, it's, it's a clear metaphor, and, it, and it's very uh, apparent that these artists were sort of personifying the landscape and putting things that they felt about humanity in it and, and the way that, as people, you know, we experience loss, and then we grow and learn from that, from that loss. And though we think of our lifespan as just, just one flowing from start to finish, like there's really lots of deaths and rebirths in our life and lots of... Um, hard things that new beautiful things come out of. So I, I think those symbols should be things that um, that we can get just by looking at them. That we we don't we don't necessarily have to research to to know them. Um, there, there are a lot of discussions today about repeating history, about painters who are painting like the painters of the past. Some feel that. We, I think many of us feel that uh, it's important to learn these techniques that have been passed from generation to generation and we're almost lost. And yet uh, there are some who argue that that's been done, that we shouldn't be repeating the past, that we should be, if we're using these techniques, we should be using contemporary sensibilities that might be reflecting society as it is today. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I, I think when I was addressing um, the, the issue of, of things that stay and, and things that change, um, that is that, that uh, fashions are things that come and then go, um, and a lot of what I would consider a contemporary culture of any period um, would, be, would be what I would consider fashion. And, and I would be thinking about sifting through those things towards what's more universal and, and profound. Um, so um, I haven't really uh, tried to represent my, my culture today and, and anymore that um, every culture is, is, uh, is in some ways fleeting. Um, so um, 
if you, if I think I'd like to take that question a little bit in the direction of, of say, just looking at, looking at historic painters and what they did. Um, a, a wise person once told me um, that, you know, if I really wanted to accomplish something philosophically with my work, that um, I, rather than make my my knowledge wide or, or broad on that subject, that I had to make that knowledge deep um, to have to have what's called a deep understanding of the subject. And um, I think like it's. Uh, I think it's a self-indulging act to say that one or another aspect, like if, if we're going to admit that something is a masterpiece and that that thing is profoundly beautiful, I think it's self-indulgent to say that it's just one or another part of that thing that's beautiful and that I can just take this part or that of it and, and say that I really understand it. Um, so when I've looked at historic movements, um, I've really been trying to look deep into those things and understand um, understand the whole of that thing, like why every single part of it is the way it is and why they did all the things that they did and how they all fit together. Um, and I do believe that that's what um, some of my favorite masters of the past have done. Like I think um, just looking at landscape painting, you know, we find uh, the originators of, of of what I would say, what became classical landscape painting. We find Claude Lorraine in the French school, and then we find um, Roysdale in the Dutch school. And most landscape painting draws from these two masters, and they were drawing from the backgrounds of figure paintings, basically. Like, um, but um, then if I look at an artist like Corot, who I love, uh, when he was young, he seemed to be just trying to be just like Claude and just understand very deeply what Claude was doing. And then when we look at, at Turner when he was young, his early paintings, they look just like Claude's paintings. You know, they, he doesn't look like he's trying to make any contemporary statement or any change. And um, the theory that I've sort of had on that subject is that the individuality of these artists um, develops later by their, by their discovery of um, the sort of fundamental truths and in the works, they're able to make work in a different way that still achieves the same fundamental goal. Um, but in the beginning, to achieve that goal, they need to understand every single part so deeply that um, it takes guidance to do that. And I think it takes the guidance of a really true master to, to understand. I once took a photography course in Vermont from a fellow by the name of Fred Picker, whose work hangs in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And Fred uh, had a, a group, a workshop of, of uh, men and women who were doing four by five photography. And I was uh, very young and I was very frustrated because I wanted to be out doing creative things. And very wisely he said to me, study it deeply so you understand the technique because when you're out doing creative things, you'll be frustrated because you won't know how to accomplish what's in your head. And if you study it deeply and, and you get to the point where it becomes second nature for you, then you can become creative. Then you can do your own thing. Right now, what I want you to do is follow the plan and, and really learn deeply mm -hmm. how, to, how to accomplish these goals. And I think that uh, that strikes me is a critical part for painters. Uh, w when I first started to paint, I was learning by emulating some of the other masters. I would copy their pieces and the atelier that I was involved with said, copy these pieces. Don't sell them, you know, <laughs> don't say that, don't, don't make them frauds, but, but understand them. And it was interesting to me, again, because I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to create my own things. But it was interesting how one slight curvature of a brush stroke made a figure look fat versus thin. Uh, the little, little subtleties that you pick up from these people about edges and light and color and everything else. So I think that the, certainly the philosophy of depth and, and really learning um, the techniques deeply uh, 
makes a, a tremendous amount of sense. Then you can go on your own course in the future. Yeah. So are you on your own course? I've started to feel like I'm getting there. <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, if I were to define what, what one's own course is, it's, it's, um, it's going to be the point where uh, one understands the common thread between disparate things um, more thoroughly than, than the different things themselves. Um, and it, if I can just clarify that, um, like if I were to say, like, well, like I just said, like how um, uh, Corot, say, came from Claude and then learned to solve that same problem in his own way, um, and then Turner came from Claude and learned to solve that same problem in his own way. And so I would say that, that Claude, Corot, and Turner have all achieved the same goal, but in, but in three different ways. And um, if I were to look at these masters, you know, maybe when I was younger, when I was in my early 20s, like if I was going through a period when I was obsessed with, with Turner, I might have made, tried to make paintings just like Turner. And then if I was obsessed with Corot, I might have tried to make paintings just like Corot or, or Cole or, or uh, Durand. But, um, but then as I've sort of started to absorb and, and understand these paintings, and as I felt like I started to understand them deeply, um, I would make decisions more based on the idea of, of just understanding what's the same about Claude and what's the same about Corot and what's the same about Turner. And, and even though those artists achieved their mastery in different ways, I feel like what they came to is the same end. Um, and uh, if I were to quantify um, what I would call that end, I would call it um, sort of the, the revelation of a, of a higher notion of, of beauty. And what I mean by that is that um, a work of art that, that I consider to be a really great work of art it's not just because of little things about it that I really like or because of um, uh, the parts or the way the paint is handled or the texture. Um, for a really great painting, I want to I wanna sit in front of it for, for 20 minutes or so and I want to feel the profound, beautiful effect of that painting. Um, and, I think, and I think that that's the thing that, that really separates the men from the boys in the history of art. You know, there, was, there were always people that were more technically proficient than Vermeer, and there was always somebody who could paint a tree more tightly than Corot. But um, the ones that, that really do it, they really find some way, whether it's this or that, to deeply stir their viewer's soul. And I think that that, that should be considered um, the direct goal of art, and that if you achieve that goal, that, that other things will be forgiven by the generations of human beings to come. So they're really drawing on something much deeper than technique. I think so. I'd like to understand a little bit about how you got where you are. You are a young man, 30. You have uh, an incredible ability, an incredible talent. Your paintings move people. I've been with you when you've painted, among other people, and your paintings get response unlike paintings that others do. Uh, you've accomplished a great goal by doing that. Where did it start? Where did this uh, desire to paint come from? Well, y you know, something that's um you know, so deeply woven into the fabric of, of uh, the history of my life is, is, I think, something that's kind of hard to define. Um, I, could, I could probably talk for a long time about um, all the landscapes I was exposed to when I was younger or, and, and their effect and um, how I was always drawing when I was younger and then I was drawing into high school. and. For some reason, I did have this obsession with with working on paper, you know, drawing things, and I always did that. Um, 
And so I had a fair understanding by the end of high school that, that what I was going to want to do with my life was going to be something with using this pencil and brush on paper, <laughs> you know, and, and I think it didn't, have, um, it didn't have much meaning for me at that time, uh, except that I just had to keep doing it and I had to get better and better at it and I kept drawing and I drew the figures and I drew everything I could draw. Um, but I, th I think um, if, if I were to try to define um, a, a turning point where um, trying to achieve greatness in art became my, my uh, purpose in life rather than, you know, other things, finding, finding girls and having fun and, and these things. I was in RISD and I was in the illustration department and I, I was starting to have that feeling that um, although I liked that I was painting and drawing, I was beginning to realize that uh, the illustration assignments weren't weren't doing it for me, like like art for this or that purpose wasn't um, wasn't lining up with what I was wanting to do, um, but I wasn't sure why. And then I had um, I had some philosophy classes in in ancient philosophy, um, in ancient philosophy, and uh, I read some Socratic dialogues, and there was a particular um, moment in uh, Plato's Symposium in a Socratic dialogue where um, there was this prescription, there, there was just this one passage that I still have highlighted in the book that um, I think has had a profound effect on my life. And uh, what, it, what it essentially describes is that um, in life, uh, the noble pursuit in life is to, well, let me, let me put this another way. Um, <clears throat> what it describes is, through the course of life, mounting a staircase uh, towards a higher notion of beauty. And at the end of that staircase, at the top, is an idea that, that they call absolute beauty. And um, the passage basically describes a progression whereby we come from, from fair forms to four act, fair, from fair forms to fair actions and fair actions to fair ideas and slowly mounting through our understanding of the universe to these larger scale universal ideas which, which embody absolute beauty. And um, <clears throat> I thought to myself, and as it said in the text, it said that that was the, the noblest and best purpose, the contemplation of absolute beauty um, as, as a way to happiness. And um, it struck me right away that that would be a good thing to try and understand by painting. And um, so that's what I've been trying to do. So have you accomplished happiness? <laughs> Has anyone truly and completely accomplished happiness? <laughs> I think um, I, still have a, I still have a drive to do more. And every time, you know, every time I finish a painting, I still feel like I have something else to learn or something else to gain. So I guess, um, you know, I guess there's still something else on that staircase to go. <laughs> well, I think you, you really hope that the staircase never ends. Yeah. Because uh, growth is important, stagnation is uh, not. The, uh, I, I had a very famous artist tell me over dinner one night that uh, even though he's one of the best artists in the world and knows it, he struggles. He can't still accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish. Still doesn't feel like he's done a great painting. And this is someone who's uh, pushing 80 years old, has been painting for a long, long time. So the satisfaction, part of that satisfaction, comes from growing and conquering. And part of that happiness is understanding that you've taken yourself to the next level. I agree with that statement. Um, and I think the only thing that I would include with that, in addition to, uh, to what you're saying that has been very important to me, is even though um, maybe as human beings we can't have perfection, or maybe in my life I won't do what I think is a perfect painting, I think that for me at least, just having that idea having that idea of absolute beauty at the end 
the, the idea that um, there is perfection and that if I seek it as well as I can that perhaps I can arrive there. So you, you were at RISD, you took these philosophy classes, and now you're on the stair <laughs> towards happiness. <laughs> what happened then? Oh boy. Well, I knew, um, I knew when I was done with RISD um, what I wanted to accomplish with painting. Um, but I didn't know how to accomplish it. And um, I, I, was, I was really studying the figure at that time. Like I had sort of, I, I had done a lot of model painting and I started to touch on um, anatomy. There was an anatomy instructor there. And, um, and uh, I was trying to figure out how to, how to go on with, I, I was doing large sort of paintings with, with some figures in them and figures in landscape. And, um, I really wanted to do what I believed I should do, which was know those master paintings deeply and, and make something that, that's really, to me, just like what, what they were doing. And um, it's, it, you know, in its essence. And, uh, and I felt like, like I had more to learn to do that. And so I went to uh, the New York Academy for, um, for a master's degree and I studied a lot of figure there. And, um, it, you know, it had a great anatomy program and it had cast drawing, which I really liked um, because I could sort of freely study these casts in a way that I felt um, helped, helped me to understand the art behind the, the sculpture, essentially. And uh, I completed the New York Academy and I was still, still finding my way and, and still feeling like I needed to learn more. Um, I did a lot of master studies, I did a lot of copying after Raphael and others. And, but uh, something that was important for me uh, through all of this education, um, including RISD and through the New York Academy, was that whatever I was studying and, and whatever instructors were teaching me, um, I was always trying to make my own work on the side, whether, whether it was in the evenings or on the weekends, or if class was four days, I'd be doing it the other three days. Um, I was just always trying to apply whatever I was learning to the act of making art, to, to make the paintings that I really wanted to make. And um, I, think, I think for me that, that gave me a lot of, of clarity of purpose, a lot of reality checks in terms of understanding what I really knew and what I didn't know. You know, like, um, I, think, I think it can be easy to think that like, oh, like, um, by, by the end of this education then, I'll, I'll have what I need to, to begin my art making. And um, I, what, I, what I've found is that um, you, you learn about art making by art making. And, and I think that um, by, by doing that alongside my education, by really trying to achieve my goals with what I was learning, um, it was easier for me to see um, what parts of what I was learning was really helpful and, and what parts were not so helpful. And, uh, and that way I could, I could easily distinguish who was a very effective instructor who was giving me lots of good stuff that was really helping with my work that was on the side and, and other instructors that gave some things that, that, were, that were technical and helpful and then other things that weren't so helpful. And, and I found it to be a, a very adequate test of of the quality of knowledge or the quality of information that I was getting to, to simply try to apply these things in the paintings that I wanted to make and then go to the museum and compare the ideas that were being presented to me to, to actual master works or, or works that I feel were, were very strong and moving and powerful works. Which artist uh, would you say is your muse? Is there one? I, I don't think I can choose one artist to say that that's 100% my muse. I think um, if I refer back to my little idea that I was talking about before, I think that the muse is the common thread between all artists. Uh, the, muse, the muse is the inspiration and, and it's the thing that uh, 
it, it's the thing that, um, that ties them all together. Um, and, and the greatest ones are the ones that are closest to that thread. And the, uh, the more mediocre ones are, are a little further away. You know, it's, it's like, it's as if there was a, a line of perfection and the proximity to it was the factor. <laughs> now, you chose something that um, from a purely practical standpoint may not be very practical. You chose to paint Hudson River School paintings. Um, it's obviously uh, American paintings, Hudson River School paintings are very popular among a certain group of people. They're wonderful paintings. But there may not be a huge demand for that. You've got to make a living. You've chosen that where you could have chosen to spend a lot more time on figurative work. I know you've sold, made and sold some figurative work for a church in Ireland and some other things. But what is it about the selection of, of becoming essentially a um, Hudson River School style painter that, um, that really gets you excited, that, that really makes you move in that direction? When when I started to move strongly in that in that direction over um, over uh, the European landscape masters that also have a strong effect on me um, was probably uh, three or four years ago. Um, you, you know, let me let me just backtrack even a little before that. Like I was I was making a lot of landscapes that were that were. Um, uh, in large part, a mix of, of mostly imagination and study from masters with a little bit of study from, from nature. And then um, three or four years ago, when I went on the Hudson River Fellowship, um, I had the opportunity to really spend, uh, really spend that entire month um, just outside painting. Um, and, and we really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's free independent research on the fellowship, like you go out and you, and you do what you want to do. Um, but what I, what I ended up doing was just getting up at seven in the morning and, and painting through until sunset every day for a month. And um, I think something, something about being outside like that every day and being in those spots where Thomas Cole painted and, and where Durian and Gifford painted and finding these exact spots where they were, and just seeing the profound beauty of, of the actual reality of those spots, um, it really drove me to, to um, really want to understand deeply that, that something that's a little bit closer to home. Um, you know, which I've had limited experience in, in the European landscape. I've been there a number of times, but, but I've had a lot of deep experiences with the American landscape. And so, I think my connection with those artists has a lot to do with with subject matter. You know, the the beauty of this land that that I find very profound and that I've grown up with. And so, after discovering this stuff deeply in the Hudson Valley, as I was sort of returning home to to the White Mountains in New Hampshire, um, I was finding the same thing there. Like, oh, there's the Thomas Cole painting of Crawford Notch. There's uh, you know, there's the the Bierstadt vista of the Moat Mountains, and like. I drove by these sites every day when I was going to high school, and I knew they were there, and I knew they were beautiful, but, but somehow just connecting to these artists and feeling like this is still there, you know? The, these things are still there just exactly as they were the day these guys painted them, and you can see exactly what they exaggerated and what they felt and what they changed. Um, and and I just loved that, and and I love to I love that feeling of of um, doing that something that's completely new and completely observable today, but just knowing that it's the exact same thing that that has always been there, or at least has been there for a hundred years. <laughs> so you um, you you get one wish granted, and we pick the wish. <laughs> That one wish is <clears throat> you get two hours in a room with those guys, Hudson River School painters. What are the questions? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. 
I mean, I feel like I would just want to inject myself into that conversation, you know. I, I would almost want to just hear what the guys would say uh, talking to each other and then, and then see, what, see what questions I had from what they were saying. I mean, I think like, uh, you know, it, what, I'll tell you what certainly doesn't jump to my mind is, is uh, what medium did you use? What green did you use? <laughs> and, and what uh, <laughs> what uh, <laughs> what brush is that? Um, though, though I think those things are those things are great for uh, for students who are who are you know struggling to understand the materials. I, I feel like um, what I really want to know is like. Um, what was the very last thing you did to that painting? <laughs> you know, what, 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 um, what was it that really, you know, I, I find there's a, there's a turning point in a painting, you know, where it's coming along for, for weeks and months and, and like somehow something clicks or you change something or just some, some little thing makes the difference that, that somehow shifts the painting from, from uh, just what it wasn't a second ago into something that's, just completely unified and, and completely different and, and so much more effective. And, and, and I would really, I'd love to hear from these guys um, how they felt about that topic, you know, how, how a painting gets finished, how much do you change things around. Like I know I'm always doing things like removing trees and, and moving earth around and adding figures and taking figures away and trying to put a cow in and taking a cow away and like I'd just like to know uh, you know how much did these guys struggle with the exact same problems that I'm struggling with or if they tended to to create a design and just stick to it or you know I'm sure it's different for different artists but I'd, I'd love to just I, I, I feel like they I feel like there, there's plenty of evidence that, that these guys uh, believed in, in a philosophy that, that was similar to the kind of things that I've been talking about. I see that in the writings of Duran and Cole, and, and I would love to talk to them about that philosophy and, and see how they feel they've been achieving it with painting. I think that would be a wonderful experience. <laughs> you know, that, that reminds me of, of uh, part of uh, Dante's Inferno where he was talking about uh, you know the levels of hell, and there was this kind of nice level of hell for the Greek for the Greek philosophers to just sit and <laughs> chat about their thing. And I always thought it was funny when I read that part. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of nice. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's the good part of hell, you know. You think of like the blues man, like uh, what is it, Robert Johnson, like going to the crossroads to learn the blues or something. <laughs> there is no good part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These, um, uh, some of these people left a very special gift. Uh, Asher Durand wrote, uh, published and wrote in the Crayon, uh, which was an art, art pu publication primarily. I've been privileged to hold those original copies in my hands and, and uh, look through them. And he wrote his 12 letters on landscape painting. Is there anything in those 12 letters that are especially important to you? Well, yes. I mean, I've, I've read those letters, um, and I find a lot of it very profound. Um, something that I was looking at uh, the last time that I read them that, that I think struck a chord with me especially was uh, Durand was discussing Raphael. And, um, I like that because I love Durand and I love Raphael, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember his, his exact words, but I remember um, what, I, what I took from the statement was, was that, um, you, you know, Durand had, had a great love for drawing from nature and he talks a lot about, about the artist, you know, recommending to the young artist to go forth and really study nature. Um, and that's with a capital N, um, which to me means not, ne not necessarily exactly what nature looks like, but the true nature of things or what, what it is, what it really is. And um, I think that that, that that sentiment that I just expressed was, was uh, um, clarified in this discussion of Raphael where where uh, Durand essentially asserts that um, when Raphael was drawing from life, uh, that this thing that he was drawing was actually what he perceived 
um, right. what he perceived in the thing. And a, as we know, as we know, Raphael, um, to, compared to a photograph of a nude model, is very, very different. You know, very idealized. And and to have have someone like Duran, the naturalist, say essentially that um, this ideal reality was actually what Raphael perceived when he looked at the world is, is I think, a powerful, powerful assertion um, b because it, it sort of reveals uh, the idea I was talking about with, with, uh, with the staircase, the, this idea that, um, that Raphael's perception of beauty or perception of reality was so high that he could create reality within this, within this completely ideal, like perfected, elegant world. And, um, and I think when you look at Duran's paintings, you can see that, you know? I, I think like at, they, at first they introduce you with this very true naturalism, but as you start to like exist in that world, I think, you know, for me at least, I really start to say, wow, this is the beautiful reality, you know? This is, this is more than meets the eye. Well, and if they transform someone to a better place, there's, there's so much value in that. And, and there are the purists who say, well, you want to you copy exactly what you see, but I, I don't see that as being purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you want to copy what you see, take a photograph. The, uh, <clears throat> I remember a, an artist friend of mine telling me about a cancer patient who bought a painting of his and put it on the wall while she went through months of chemotherapy and stayed in bed. And, and she said that painting pulled her through it, that that painting took her to a different place. It was a, almost a sense of meditation and staring at it. And I think that's what you're able to accomplish. I, I get that, that very special feeling when I look at one of your paintings. They, uh, um, they have a, a special quality about them. I can't articulate what that quality is. I, I study them, I look at them, I've spent a lot of time with you this week. I've seen you um, create paintings and I still can't figure it out. So there's something about that finalization that, that you've been able to accomplish too, which I think is, is powerful. If you were, uh, talking to the parent of a young child or, or a teenager who wanted to explore a life of art, or uh, someone who maybe is my age who says, you know what, it's time for me to take that next step. Uh, what things for you were a waste? What things did you not get? What things do you wish you got? And what, what would you tell people to pursue to read, to understand? I think that um, you certainly can't force anyone, you know, to, to pursue art. I think that, um, I think that that's a, a drive that's, that's internal, or at least in my experience. Um, what my feeling about my development and some of those living artists who I respect the most um, I look at what they do and it seems like they couldn't really do anything else. Like, um, and I think, I think in some sense, like truly pursuing art at the highest level is, is something that, um, isn't entirely a choice that you make by reason. It's, uh, it, there's definitely an intuition involved and, and I guess I would recommend to someone um, who's driven to that, who's really driven to want to make great paintings, that they do that. You know, um, there's there's one thing standing in the way between between making great paintings and not doing that, and it, I think that that thing is is a fear. Um, it, you know that. Uh, develops from all kinds of factors in your life um, and I just think that if if that's fundamental and that that's in you that um, you have to you have to do it 
you know, you have to try to do the things that you don't think somewhere inside of you that you can do. You have to try to do them. Because this task, when you look at a museum masterpiece and you think, like, how would I make a painting like that? The task seems so large and overwhelming that it can be intimidating and, and, um, and it can even seem impossible. Like, I have to learn anatomy, I have to learn perspective, all these things, you know, all these schools of knowledge and sciences and religion and philosophy, all these things are piled up into this one epic thing which humanity has put on a pedestal and raised up and lit with beautiful big lights, you know? <laughs> and and, and it's, it's intimidating, and I just think I would recommend, like, go for it, you know? Try to do that. Try to do that thing that's just what you want to do. And, and you'll fail, and you'll learn so much more by failing than you will by not trying. Well, well clearly, um, somebody who has the passion, uh, like myself, I had the passion. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I was frustrated, and I tried more. And I, I remember very specifically, as a matter of fact, I still have the unfinished canvas. I was doing a figure painting, and I could not get what was in my head onto the canvas. And I tried that painting over and over and over, it seemed like for months, and I couldn't get there. And my wife, um, in, in a moment of my frustration, said, you need to go study with somebody. And I did, and I, I feel like I skipped about 12 years just going from one level to a, to a much higher level because of having the benefit of that education from that master that I studied under. And <clears throat> I, I think that ha having someone to show you the way, you have to find your own way. You have to make your own mistakes. Clearly, that's a very big part of the learning process. But you also need to have that feedback. You need to have someone who is pulling it out of you and someone who is also helping you answer some of those questions because uh, you know we're talking about 600 years of technique that have been passed from one generation to another to another and a body of knowledge which has increased exponentially and we need to help people find some of that body of knowledge too much too fast is not appropriate uh, some of it needs to be self-discovery. But assuming that we have that drive, assuming we have that passion, where does that person who's watching this right now, who wants to get there, where do they go? Because sometimes reading in a book isn't enough. I mean, if, if, if I have one recommendation in that regard, I would say um, to look a lot at um, the actual works produced by the artists that you're going to learn from and try to seek um, those living artists that produce most closely what you feel that you're looking for. Um, Chase what you respect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that like I, I've had a lot of instructors um, of all different kinds, and, and the ones that I've sort of stuck with are, are the people that, um, that that I've come to really respect their work, and um, and I think uh, I think that that would be the main thing. You know, make sure that you're climbing a ladder that that you want to climb. You know, if if you look at if you look at you, you know when when you're setting out down the beginning, look at the end. You know, if if the end of what an artist producing it, is producing is, is different from what you want to make. You need to know what those differences are when, when you go to study with them and, and make sure you know what you want, you know, what you want to learn. One thing that I experienced in my own life, and I see it happen time and again with artists and with collectors, is that you grow. I shudder at the things that I liked when I was 17 years old. 
thank goodness I didn't have them tattooed on my body because I would <laughs> seriously regret that now. And I watched myself go through this, transform this transformation process of increasing the level of sophistication of what uh, I became passionate about. Uh, and it's interesting in my world where um, I started out as a painter uh, with garish colors and uh, things that were that I look back on now. I keep my old paintings because I want to refer to them yeah. as uh, just as a memory, <clears throat> um, and sometimes I want to burn them because I don't want them to be something I'd be remembered for. But it it it's nice to be able to look back. I showed you a painting that I did that was a copy of a Durand or something, and. I look at it now and the colors are garish and the, you know, the edges are too sharp and there's just no, there's no depth to it. Um, and I still haven't accomplished where I want to go, but I, I think it's interesting to see how we jump from level to level. I see collectors who, they buy things that now they look back and say five years later, I can't even believe I bought that. Uh, I had a collector tell me he had a half a million dollars worth of art in the basement in a storage room because he couldn't stand to look at it anymore. And he couldn't sell it because it was no longer worth any money. So what is that, what is that learning process? What, how, how do I, as a viewer, pull myself up to that next level? How, I, you know, I, I find, for instance, if you look at your paintings, uh, and if you look at the paintings of, say, Corot, they're gray. They're not bright, garish colors at all, and yet when you look at them, you feel like you're in nature and, and they feel right. They don't, they don't feel unnatural at all. Well, I, I guess I think you, you got to answering your own question a little bit there. I, I think that uh, if, if you look at the painting, it, you know, I guess as, as a collector or a viewer or appreciator, appreciator of art, um, I would say don't be, don't be influenced at all by um, the things that are around you. Uh, these, these paintings that are great were, were made to be understood by you. And, um, and you know, you don't need to be influenced by art dealers and you don't need to be influenced by rhetoric and, and whatever is being said to you uh, because great art was made for you and, and you can tell. If, if it is creating that meditative, high, beautiful sensation in you. And um, I think that if you can look deeply and honestly into yourself and, and tap that powerful sensation, then you have connoisseurship in, in art. And, then, um, and so from that point, it's up to you to say, by knowing that this has affected me deeply, that I'm collecting something that's that's going to last. You know, if uh, I've never heard someone say that um, that they've fallen out of love with a painting that, you, you know, I'm I'm sure that the person that, that you discussed that that had that painting that that in some way contributed to saving their life, I'm sure they're not going to fall out of love with that painting. And and I think that if a painting gives you that thing, that's that's that powerful, and if, if you're able to identify it, then you're going to be a good collector. Let your heart speak to you. Yes. Well, Eric, this has been a wonderful chat. Uh, you're a brilliant painter. You've got a wonderful career ahead of you, and uh, I'm very proud of you, and proud of what you've been able to accomplish at your young age, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you accomplish in the next 50 years, and I'll be there watching. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, very much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Well, that is Eric Capel, and the video is called Techniques of the Hudson River School Masters. It's the first of two. The second one is a plein air one. Anyone, you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. And there's a special discount code for you, for use for today only, and it's in the comments section. Well, thanks for watching. I want to remind you we have a special video. It's two hours long. It's a $107 value, and it's free for you today. You can get it. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Leading Artists.
That's yours for free at 97tips.com. Well, I'm Eric Rhodes. See you tomorrow. So I've got my deep space plane established and I'm going to move forward to that secondary hill and while I'm working on that hill I'm going to be thinking of the transition forward into the middle ground. So as I work on this area I'm not just thinking hill, I'm going to be thinking furthest back hill, moving to forward hill, moving to middle ground and that way I'll be moving one loop of space that's going to prepare me to work on the foreground. And I always want to have that in mind, that uh, this hill is not a flat phenomenon. It's, an, it's a large mass of Earth that's moving in space, and that's going to be crucial to this composition. It's really where that atmosphere starts to materialize itself into forms, and we're going to try and get as much detail as we can into the forms of that area without bringing it forward. So I need a more purpley, cool shadow color. I'm going to get that Venetian red a little bit closer to that white. And I'll put a little ultramarine blue over there. And I'll create this area right there. Someone described the area on Gifford's palette as where he mixed colors as a battleground. So if I want to make a purple, the battleground will be here between red, white, and blue. Let's get a little bluer purple. Let's see where we are. I want more white in that. I want a nice, even more white for a cool color will make a nice even layer of space and so I'm just putting a nice load of white into there and spreading it around so it has a smooth atmospheric quality. I'm going to start to come up to the edge of the contour of the hill. I'm going to try and not make it too even. And I'm going to add little tree edges up there in a little bit. I'll add some texture to it. I'm going to um, use a warm brown color because I know a little bit of that color from the sky underneath is going to come through. So I've got burnt sienna and uh, burnt umber. I'm also going to grab a brush to use as a mall stick. And I wanted to move my tree in a little bit closer to the landscape, so I think I'm going to plant that pair of trees right about here, just leaving a little bit, a little bit of area behind it. And I'm just going to add a little bit more medium so it's a nice light line when I, when I start to trace out where I'm going to place this tree in the composition. I want it to be, um, I want it to have that feeling of loft that it really, really swoops out into the landscape and um, rises up into this area of space. So this doesn't have to be perfect trunks yet. I'm just planning out the big, the big motion of this tree so I know that it'll occupy the space that I want it to occupy. And these, these lines will probably get buried under the more detailed work as, as the tree develops. And these beautiful oaks always have these, these lovely swoops in their branches, and I'll start to think about that um, as I block this in. Isn't it kind of nice the way this, this curve here counteracts the curve of that hill and makes a, a, a lovely harmonic design that uh, is, is subtle. It doesn't it doesn't beat you over the head with it, but it but it's apparent and it and it's a, a gesture that shoots back into space. The, those two things against each other. So I'll plan a little bit where I'm going to have the counter curving tree and its sort of massive foliage, and then I know I'm going to have some more trees over here 
blocking out a lot of the distance space on that side. And so if I have these ones planted on the ground here and here, then I have a deeper position of space here to sort of create a nice uh, grouping of trees to cover up that space so that we can really get back into the composition. A lot of times when I'm painting a studio painting, I'll go through several different figures before I find an option I like, but I might also wait a long time and look at the painting and as I've looked at it for, for days and days, I sometimes discover right where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing. So we'll see if that 